You were born in the long summer. You've never known anything else. But now winter is truly coming. And in the winter, we must protect ourselves. Look after one another. I don't want to frighten you. But I won't lie to you either. We've come to a dangerous place. I feel a bit sorry for Lord Eddard Stark, aka Ned Stark, because I think a lot of people read his story in the first book and chalk him down as some admirable, honourable idiot. Sometimes even idealised into this pure hero killed by a corrupt world. I don't think that's fair. Ned Stark is neither an idiot nor exactly a hero. He's more complex than that. What he definitely is, is basically a good man, which does make it somewhat difficult to pick apart his psychology. Like, with Cersei or Tyrion and stuff, there's so much there going on all over the place in their internal worlds and so much irrational behaviour to pick apart and we do get that with Ned, just less so and when this is basically analysing a fictional character at a distance where I can't talk to them and ask questions and everything, it does make it difficult. You know, Ned basically wants to be a good person, there's nothing out of the ordinary or fascinating about that in and of itself. What is interesting I think is how he wants to be basically a good man, the pressures he places on himself, the judgement he has for himself and others, the principles and ideas he has about what honour actually means to him, and also, crucially, the mistakes he makes. His mistakes aren't really a case of him being politically stupid, there is more going on there. Also what makes it difficult is there are aspects of Ned that feel like they are yet to be revealed in the book, so that can leave a few gaps here. For example, what exactly happens with his sister Leanne? We can hazard a good guess, but we can't be certain and don't fully know what he thinks or feels about it either. Same with what happens to Arthur Dane, Ned probably kills him, yes, but is there more to the fact he carries Arthur's sword all the way back to his ancestral home? What about Ashara Dane, who at one point Ned seems to have some attraction to, who seems to kill herself after her brother Arthur dies, and who some claim to be the actual mother of Jon Snow. She's probably not Jon's mother, but something is going on there. Those are pedantic, small all points, yes, but I'm just mentioning them quickly now before we get started. The other one being what does Ned think or feel about his brother Benjamin Stark? We aren't shown too much depth to their relationship and it feels like a big reveal is coming about things there. Why after all their other family were killed, meaning it would be politically crucial for both Ned and Benjamin to start producing heirs, why did Benjamin instead decide to quite quickly sign up for the Night's Watch, giving up all claim to land and fathering no children. It does just feel like there's more information coming there that can paint a clear picture of Ned's history, yes, and also provide more insight into his character. Maybe I'll have to do an update on this video if George ever actually finishes the series, who knows. Anyway, we're going to begin. I should politely point out World Anvil are sponsoring this video and my channel at the moment, that's pretty cool. Um, but we'll get to them later. It's time we start doing the analysis stuff. Yes. Ned Stark has been described as the Quiet Wolf by Mira and I think Howland Reed, which is a fitting name. It's easy to forget the Starks are technically known for their fiery, wild nature that they refer to as the wolf's blood in them. And Ned can show some of that, he does have a temper, we also see him quite bluntly and forcefully grab Littlefinger by the throat when he mistakes Catelyn hiding in the brothel for Littlefinger insulting his wife. But that said, he is most definitely the reserved, quieter, colder, more reflective Stark among the family. Let's look at his siblings. Um, well, his older brother Brandon was born a year before Ned, the wildest and most temperamental of them all, but also brilliant. An excellent swordsman, jouster, rider, confident possibly to the point of overconfident as Barbary Dustin describes, never shy about taking what he wanted. And, of course, the heir destined to inherit his father's titles. I'm afraid all this section of the video is going to be very loose speculation based on the little we know of their childhoods. I'm saying that as a warning, I encourage you to question my thoughts here, and I promise we'll get to the more clear-cut stuff later on, but anyway, having this 
brilliant, confident brother who is only one year older and is destined to be the heir where you will not be, you will have to find something else to do with your life. That could obviously affect you in a lot of different ways, such as maybe being very eager to compete with Brandon's brilliance, the way I think their younger sister Liana seems quite keen to ride and joust and sort of compete with this world of the strictly male stuff in Westeros society. Or he could find something else, some other way to be noticed, to earn approval and affection from his parents, even just to define himself. I am not my brother, so what is my identity? Ned becomes very opposite to Brandon. Reserved where Brandon is loud and boisterous, restrained where Brandon is wild, a thinker and observer more than impulsive. Nothing groundbreaking there, <laughs> different siblings often grow up up being very distinct in their personalities. Siblings are often quite keen to be opposites, and I suspect Ned's parents were also encouraging and caring enough to let him feel able to grow into his own person, rather than this constant sibling war with each other that we see between all three Lannister children, not just Tyrion and Cersei, all three of them. Um, but we also get this quote that tells us not only is Brandon a better fighter and destined heir, but also in Ned's mind a better leader. Brandon, yes. Brandon would know what to do. He always did. It was all meant for Brandon. You, Winterfell, everything. He was born to be a king's hand and father to queens. So Brandon has all the responsibility and pressure and also attention that comes from being the heir that must learn how to lead people. Ned can't be that great heir without all sorts of murderous fantasies that would leave him feeling terribly guilty. I suppose if we did want to get all Freudian about it, we could wonder if there was a very unconscious, jealous, childish part of Ned's that did half wish he could be heir instead of his brother. A wish that would turn horrifically to guilt when his brother did then die, making Ned's heir. Magical thinking, they call it, the fear that us wishing something then somehow magically causes it to happen. It's like how Jon Snow mentions that in his past he used to dream of being Lord of Winterfell, and then... Rob dies, and Stannis gives him the chance to make that wish a reality. Jon says no, of course he does, but if he had said yes, I'm certain he would have had all sorts of troubling guilt about the idea of taking Rob's rightful place. About the fact he used to dream of that. Those kind of guilts, you know, this is a total tangent though. <laughs> um, the point is, suppress those desires, don't dream about being heir, because that would mean dreaming of your brother Brandon's death. Instead, go, no, I don't want to be lord, I don't want to be a leader, I don't want to even think of that, I want to instead be my brother's very loyal supporter. Very much as we see Kevin is to Tywin, just as Jon, whilst sometimes very keen to outshine Rob in sword fighting, is also staunchly, fiercely loyal supporter of Rob. Never gonna compete with him for the idea of leadership. A younger Ned is very, very much a follower exclusively. Not that I like labelling people followers and leaders, it's ridiculous. Of course there's times where he is showing leadership abilities. All of us show both of those things at times, it's, it's healthy for us to be able to show both of those things, but still, um, we see it again when he is sent to live in the Vale with John Aaron as a sort of surrogate father there. He strikes up a friendship with Robert Baratheon, a boisterous, wild character very similar to Brad, and who is clearly the leader of their friendship group, where Ned is again his loyal supporter. Right down to Robert being the one who becomes king. Yes, Robert has the better claim, yes, I think it was John Aaron's idea, but of course he's the one who becomes king, of course Ned's the one supporting him. The point is, and this is conjecture, but perhaps this also hints at the deeply honourable good side of Ned. I can't be as brilliant as Brand and I can't be noticed in that way. I know I'll be as good as I can instead. I'll be dutiful, honourable, righteous, virtuous, that kind of good. Um, I can at least be better than him at that, and if I am his closest supporter, his right hand man, then being able to to offer good counsel is the most important thing I can do for him. There is a fulfilling pride to be found in being the loyal supporter to another. Was this kind of dutiful side of Ned then also enhanced by the fact Robert Aaron played a big hand in raising him, a man who was fiercely honourable and dutiful? He may not have imprinted the idea of honour so firmly onto Robert, but it's, it's unsurprising Ned would be more receptive to it. If we go back to that quote though, there's a deeper point that I will make 
after I subtly slide this sponsorship integration in here. This video is sponsored by World Anvil. I know I rarely do sponsors, but this is one I am really excited about because World Anvil is really cool. World Anvil is an online tool for world building, campaign building, character creation, management, good for writers, game masters, and participants of said games from Dungeons and Dragons to all these other ones I haven't heard of. Oh, I do know some of them actually, but world building can feel daunting when there's so much to do. World Anvil makes a massive difference difference giving you all the tools and features you could possibly need. A lot of different features. The one I find the most fun though is their Chronicles feature. Say you want to design your own calendar for your world. You can pop in all the information, have the calendar generated, then build a timeline of historical events linked to that calendar or several calendars with all sorts of hyperlinks you might want sprawling to other articles, and then upload a map and link different events to locations on the map so you can easily see where and when everything happened. I find that so handy. And if the timeline affects how the map looks, such as a big city getting destroyed or whatever else, you can add altered maps to reflect those changes. Plus, you can have different timelines running together. <laughs> there, are, there are other features to World Anvil too. I just get a bit excited about that one specifically because my organisation is chaotic at best. And a good five years ago, I tried to plot out this stuff with my own calendar and timelines for my novel on paper. And I got in a complete muddle and something like this is just perfect for me. So yeah, I have a link in the description and as a pinned comment with the code TREE, which will offer you 40% off all their yearly subscriptions. You know, we're coming up to Christmas, that could make one hell of a Christmas present, if not for yourself. So check the link. World Anvil is seriously really good and you can tell it's made by people who are passionate, right down to touches like this. Look at that. <laughs> now back to the video. So yes, uh, the quote, I'll read it again. Brandon would know what to do, he always did. It was all meant for Brandon. You, Winterfell, everything. He was born to be a king's hand and father to queens. I never asked for this cup to pass to me. So there's that guilt again. Partly survivor's guilt, maybe partly the fact he's actually taking Brandon's place. His older brother dies alongside his father, which we'll get to do specifics of later, um, but Ned suddenly becomes Lord of Winterfell. Of course there's going to be some imposter feelings there, and feeling that, both a guilt for taking Brandon's place, and imposter feelings that even may go as far as to feel like he's not worthy of this role, he's not good enough for it, not to be a leader, not to be Brandon. What might you do feeling all these things. You might try to mitigate those insecurities by putting in strenuous, incredible effort to be as good in that role as you ever possibly could. Take it on like a real intense duty. I mean it already is a big duty and Ned's obviously already a dutiful person by this point, but even more so, try so damn hard to A, honour your brother and father's memories and B, to try to prove that you can be good enough, you can be worthy of this title. You know, leadership power, honours, those things, they never do feel like an honour to Ned, a reward. They instead feel just like a duty, the duty part only, you know? Hence, of course he doesn't want to go to King's Landing as Robert's hand. In the show they've made it that he does, but in the books, Catelyn has to convince him to go. One part of him, at least, doesn't feel up to the role, and he does hold himself to an incredibly rigorous, unforgiving standard in how he rules. You were too hard on yourself, Ned. You always were. Robert declares. I love the moment in the first book where the very second Ned arrives at the capital as the new Hand of the King, very tired and exhausted after a long, hard, emotionally draining journey. He has a steward immediately come up to him and request his presence for a meeting with the council now. It will be convenient on the morrow, Ned snapped as he dismounted, and the steward bows to go and send his message, but then he says, no, damn it, Ned said. It would not do to offend the council before we had even begun. I will see them. Then when he comes, he apologises for lateness. When he is slightly snappy, but not at all impolite in response to something, he apologises. He would have to remember that he was no longer in Winterfell, where only the king stood higher. Here, he was but first among equals. Forgive me, my lords. When, no, he, he doesn't need to be so apologetic and equal. He is hand of the king. He is worthy. He is above them. He is allowed to not be perfect. I'm not sure Ned ever truly recognises how much power he could assert as hand of the king when he had the chance. So, yes, there's that. A man who has kind of always been a follower, suddenly forced to become a leader. Some level of internal doubts that he isn't good enough to equal Brandon would 
be natural, I think. I was going to discuss his younger siblings here as well, but I've talked an absolute ton already. Uh, put sure, we don't know enough about the younger sibling Benjin to say anything concrete about his relationship to Ned, so never mind. Liana was three years younger than Ned, seemingly close enough to confide in Ned her concerns about being betrothed to Robert Baratheon. It seems Ned was protective of his younger sister. The protective side of him probably enhanced when she also died, leaving him with a promise that was probably to look after Jon Snow, probably keeping his true identity a secret. Probably. Um, we'll mention her more next though, so let's move on. Right, we'll quickly recap the events of Robert's Rebellion, happening when Ned was still only about 20, I think. His younger sister Lyanna was betrothed to his best friend Robert, which Robert was massively, massively keen on, whereas Lyanna confided to Ned that she was less keen. Robert had a history for sleeping with other women, and Lyanna doubted Robert's love for him would change that. Then there was a great tourney at Harrenhal. Prince Rhaegar Targaryen won the jousts, and as tradition was to present a laurel to someone in the crowd, crowning them the queen of love and beauty for the tawny. Rather than Rhaegar presenting it to his wife, as you might expect, he passed over to give it to Lyanna instead, something both Brandon Stark and Robert Baratheon were very unhappy about. Then, sometime before Brandon was set to marry Catelyn Tully, Lyanna Stark met Prince Rhaegar on the road, who seemingly abducted her and took her away to a tower in Dawn that he named the Tower of Joy. Brandon Brandon was furious when he found out about this, so he rushed with a handful of men to King's Landing, demanding that Rhaegar show himself so that Brandon could kill him, they could fight. Um, Rhaegar wasn't there, but the King was, who imprisoned Brandon on grounds of treason and summoned his father, Rickard Stark, to come to King's Landing and answer for his son's crimes. Rickard came and demanded a trial by combat. King Eris somewhat agreed to this, but declared his champion in the trial would be fire, and he hung Rickard Stark in all his armour over flames so that he would be boiled alive. Brandon was bound with a rope around his neck and a sword just out of reach to free his father. Brandon ended up strangling himself in the effort to reach the sword. Horrible awful deaths that sent shockwaves. So, in a very short space of time, Ned's sister has been abducted and his father and brother brutally killed. And then King Aerys demands the heads of his best friend Robert and of Ned himself, which is where Jon Arryn rose up against the king in rebellion. And then so did Robert and so did Ned. They went to war, first winning the Battle of the Bells, after which Ned married Catelyn Tully instead of Brandon, which, again, vitally important if we talk about imposter feelings. He literally filled his brother Brandon's place of marriage. Then they carried on the war, these two best friends, Ned and Robert, and their somewhat surrogate father, John Arryn, joined again to defeat a brutal evil in the world. Three great companions. It wasn't exclusively them, obviously, but that's how it might have felt on some level. I point that out because that's not how it turned out feeling for Ned. Which is where we need to talk about suppressed rage. Can you imagine the anger you would feel when your sister has been abducted by the prince and your brother and father murdered by the king? And yes, you might argue that Lyanna could have gone willingly with Prince Rhaegar, but even if she did, Ned wouldn't have known that at the time, so it's all the same. Not only that though, but that your brother and father were murdered for no good reason. Murdered in one of the most awful, cruel ways even imaginable. Furious is an understatement in that situation. The incredible grief there. Consciously, this rebellion wasn't about anger and revenge. I mean, it might have been less consciously. John Aaron, Robert Raffian, and Ned Stark all had very personal intense reasons to seek revenge, but their cause had to be more than that if they wanted to get far. To Honourable Ned, it may have been a war for justice, but of course there's some furious part of even him wanting more than that. So you fight this war, a war for justice, and you finally reach the capital to kill the king, and you discover the city has already been attacked. More than attacked. The infamously brutal Tywin Lannister has sacked the entire city. God knows how many people were slaughtered there. And then the son of Tywin Lannister, Jaime, who is the sworn protector to the king, has turned against his oath and murdered King Aerys. And then also that Prince Rhaegar's wife and 
two little children were killed by the even more infamously brutal Sir Gregor Clegane, raped and killed with the son's head crushed against the wall. The sight of these children and their mother haunts Ned's memories. Lord Tywin had laid the bodies beneath the Iron Throne, wrapped in the crimson cloaks of his house guard. That was clever of him. The blood did not show so badly against the red cloth. The little princess had been barefoot, still dressed in her bedgown. And the boy, the boy. Understandably, Ned might stop to question, was this justice? Did we fight a war for good here? Thousands of men killed. No doubt Ned knew a lot of his own men personally. Dead for a war in which the innocents of King's Landing are slain and the immoral, politically ambitious likes of Lannister piggyback the cause for their own agenda. If though, if there was a side of Ned furious and desiring revenge, even if it wasn't conscious, then seeing the results of this war, having had such an anger, that must have left him disgusted that he ever desired it. If the aftermath of this war is where rage leads you, then Ned would want none of it. He might have been sickened by what he played a hand in. Yes, there was good reason, good cause to rebel, but for the war to be won like this, there's probably a part of Ned that would have blamed himself for that. War is brutal far more than it's often glorified as being. Of course the brutality here would have left an impression on this still 20 year old boy with no surviving family besides a younger brother who would soon join the Night's Watch. Not that we actually know when Ned's mum died, I just assume it was before the rebellion because we never hear anything about her at all, but also Ned has always looked up to Robert as his formidable leader, just as he looked up to Brandon. Placing Robert on the throne should be doing good in the world, and yet Robert pardons Jamie for killing the king and Tywin for bringing him the bodies of the Targaryen children. Robert is pleased to see them dead. Both are points Ned is furious about enough to fall out with his good friend and basically storm away. What's more, Robert even marries Tywin's daughter Cersei and allows Jaime to serve as his personal Kingsguard. Did they just remove one brutal family from rule only for another equally brutal family to start gaining power to influence his good friend Robert? It's a good question. And all of this may have been made even worse if it does turn out Lyanna wasn't abducted but wanted to go with Rhaegar as well. Because after this rebellion Ned went south to lift the siege, then to find Lyanna dying in the Tower of Dawn. I can't see why three members of the Kingsguard would have needed to fight her brother to the death if she wasn't held there against her will, but still, if she did choose to be there then that would make Ned's guilt twice as bad, because now the whole reason for the war in the first place was wrong, and the point is, Ned comes out of all of this suppressing his rage. As the description goes, his grief and his rage froze hard inside him. A description that's attributed to all Starks, but particularly fitting for Ned, I think. He's seen the horrors that can come of rage, partly his own rage. He's also somewhat seen the rage turn his best friend into a monster who sides with the Lannisters in Ned's mind. So perhaps he freezes up all his anger into this icy shell that neither resolves his grief nor truly expresses it. Ned is just kind of stuck. There. Perhaps small wonder then this internal code of honour might grow even more rigorous than before. Now he has to keep himself totally restrained to keep that terrific destructive rage he has out of things and to keep his own desires out of all judgement. It took a lot of words to make that point, um, <laughs> I hope it makes sense. There's a clearer, more profound effect I think this war has on Ned though, which we're going to discuss next. So following all this horror and grief, Ned understandably wants to go back to Winterfell. He's lost almost all his family, so we focus his effort on creating a new one with Kaplan. That would be a very sensible thing to devote your time to doing, obviously, but also quite a healing focus. Ned has no interest in the politics of the South at this point. He doesn't see his friend Robert for years. He wants to stay in the North and focus on family and things there where it makes sense. And I make that sound like a big thing, that it's like an escape going back to Winterfell, escaping all of this viperous politics of the South, but it's quite a natural thing to want to do, to want to go home after all this loss. In a way, Winterfell is a painful reminder of the family that he's lost, but in another way, it's it's perfect. And life is still hard and bleak. Yes, the book begins with Bran, a young child having to witness a beheading as some rite of passage. I think the point there is obvious, but it's also still somehow quite innocent and sheltered. The tone around those early Winterfell scenes in the first book feels like a bit of a clash between those two things there, which is very fitting for who Ned is. 
and I'll come back to that in a second, but let me make this other point first. When Ned sees his wife Catelyn, his first thought is often to ask about the kids. His voice was distant and formal. Where are the children? He would always ask her that. When Catelyn tells him that Jon Arryn is dead, his immediate response is this. She could see the grief on his face, but even then he thought first of her. Your sister, he said. And Jon's boy, what word of them? When Ned learns King Robert is coming to visit them at Winterfell, he says, It'll be good to see the children. The youngest was still sucking at the Lannister woman's teeth the last time I saw him. He must be, what, five by now? There are many other examples, but the point is Ned is a very family oriented man. He cares about children. It's not just for political reasons that he's keen to have so many of them. And obviously some of that will just be that that's how Ned is. Again, masterful analysis. We don't know much more, but um, we do also know the image of Rhaegar's wife, Elia Martell, and her children is an image that haunts him. And I think in that context you start to realise that Ned is kind of supercharged with the idea of protecting children. He argues so fervently to the point of even resigning as Hand of the King when Robert wants the 14 year old Daenerys Targaryen dead. Ned argues that case despite even thinking to himself, Ned knew he was pushing this well past the point of wisdom, yet he could not keep silent. And equally, despite this definitely not being a wise thing to do, he warns Cersei that he's going to tell Robert all her children are actually bastards, therefore none of them are heirs to the throne. He warns her of this despite at points recognising she might fight back, precisely because he knows Robert would kill those children when he finds out. Ned warns her and wants her to flee the city in order to save those children's lives. What strange fit of madness led you to tell the Queen that you had learned the truth of Joffrey's birth? The madness of mercy, Ned admitted. When Renly suggests striking fast, seizing Cersei and her children and holding them captive until Ned is confirmed as Lord Protector, Ned disagrees because I will not dishonour his last hours on earth by shedding blood in his halls and dragging frightened children from their beds. And again, Ned is not the fool people seem to mistake him for here. He knows there is a great deal of sense to Renly's advice. He just cannot abide threatening and harming children. He had no taste for these intrigues, and there was no honour in threatening children. And yet, if Cersei elected to fight rather than flee, he might well have need of Renly's hundred swords, and more besides. The horror of what happened to Rhaegar's children scars Ned, possibly also the horror of what happened to Lyanna, he might still see her as a child at the time, possibly the horror of what happened to Brandon here, it scars him enough that he cannot countenance any similar horrors happening to other children again. Murdering kids is a line he simply will not cross. Perhaps out of guilt, perhaps out of a wish to make up for what happens to Elia and her children, perhaps a means to absolve himself. When this is a man who helped fight an entire war to try and do something good and just, only to be appalled by the results. Even more so when the friend, the king he once loved, now appears a shadow of himself ruled by a nest of vipers, then Yes, Ned is a man who is going to argue doing bad things to achieve something good is not good enough. We have to fight with good methods, even if it risks everything. Whilst all these ideas of honour certainly becomes a somewhat rigorous code he freezes himself into, perhaps even out of guilt for that too, really I think his motivations are about protecting the innocence of the world, or at least of children. Even then he does seem in conflict with himself at times, hence this weird conflict in the early Winterfell scenes between sheltering and protecting innocence, and also showing the brutal aspects of life. Ned is both a man constantly reciting that winter is coming, Bran needs to grow up, Rob needs to learn to be a lord, Rickon is a three year old boy afraid of a dire wolf, but Ned frowned. He must learn to face his fears, he will not be free forever, and winter is coming. And yet at the same time he's also a man who shelters his children from a lot of the harshness of the world. There are definite gaps in Rob's education I think. Sansa goes to King's Landing horrifically naive about the world that she really really, really should have been warned about. He regularly protests about whoever being just a child, and they therefore need to be protected. Like, uh, when he learns Rob has assembled an army, his immediate response is, Rob is only a boy, Ned said, aghast. Something that's not actually in the books as far as I can remember but does make some sense is when in the show Ned tries to make up for the death of Sansa's direwolf lady by bringing her a doll and her telling Ned she hasn't played with dolls in years. She's 
not so young as he likes to imagine. That isn't in the books, but it does make sense for how he does such a bad job helping Sansa with her grief over Lady, not really talking to her about it, failing to explain much of what happens in King's Landing. The point is, Ned seems quite afraid of dangers befalling his children, perhaps hence his first question to Catelyn always being where are the children, but out of that, out of already losing two siblings, out of what he's seen befall the children of Elia Martell, Ned seems left with a conflict between having his children grow up and face the realities of the world, particularly so with his sons. I think there definitely is some level of gender to this, but not exclusively. And then a side of him wanting to keep them sheltered, because they are innocents, and innocence needs protecting. Half prepared him for the world that has so devastated him, yet also wanting to spare them from it. I'm getting bogged down too much in this stuff now though, so let's move on. I talked quite a bit in my video on Jaime Lannister about why Ned judges him so coldly for his murder of King Aerys. Principally, I think he judges Jaime killing Aerys for two reasons. One, he only turned on Aerys after Brandon and Rickard had already been burned alive by King Aerys. You know, if Jaime was turning on the king for the sake of morality, then he left it a bit, a bit late. Again, Ned didn't know of any wildfire plot, he was never told about it, and I think whether entirely rational or not, you can understand why someone grief-stricken, especially when all of his rage around this grief gets frozen away into something icy, why he might end up blaming someone like Jamie in part, and why he might be so particularly judgmental. And two, Ned has also just walked through a city sacked brutally by Tywin. Tywin being Jamie's dad, who had technically been on King Aerys' side of the war, technically, until he saw which way the wind was blowing and suddenly switched to save his own skin. Seeing that, and then seeing Tywin's son also kind of switching sides at the last moment in murdering the king, can make it look like Jaime and Tywin's efforts were coordinated. So I think you can understand why he's so quick to judge Jaime when he sees him on the throne, and Jaime doesn't explain, and they don't really encounter each other again for ages. Ned is very judgmental in a lot of situations, I think really because he's rocked by the painful realisation of just how morally complicated the world is. Brutal things happen to his family, and when he tries to set them right, even more brutal things happen. I think the frustration of a world that doesn't live up to the ideals. That could make a person blindly optimistic, it could make them bitterly cynical. I think in Ned's case it leaves him more intensely tying himself to an increasingly high standard and high ideal, and frustrated by everyone that doesn't live up to that, including himself. And yeah, when the Lannisters are the most obvious targets for judgement, he of course judges and perhaps even projects onto them. A lot of people criticise Ned like he's really stupid for not agreeing to politically side with the Lannisters when it becomes the most pragmatic solution, but like, they murdered John. Aaron, they pushed his son out of a window, Jamie kills Jory Cassell and other of Ned's close men. <laughs> of course he doesn't side with them, that's not stupid, that's not even being a super honourable person, that's human. I think Ned is mostly a very good father, but it's worth just pointing out some of the differences in his children. Principally, he clearly favours Arya, probably because she is incredibly similar to Lyanna. Arya gets more attention than Sansa. It's Arya, things are explained too much more, Ned actually sits down with her to warn her about the dangers in King's Landing and why they have to stick together, but he has no such talk with Sansa. Equally, Arya gets Sirio Pharrell, a dancing instructor, where Sansa Sansa gets nothing, um, most of the time seems to just involve being left with Septim Ordain. And that's how it feels for Sansa, like she's a bit neglected. Adds to that, Ned literally executes her direwolf lady and then does not have a conversation or try to comfort her about it at all really. You know, at least Ned sort of discusses Micah and sword practice with Arya, but nothing with Sansa. And yeah, that is probably pretty common by the standards of Westeros, but of course she's angry with her father then, of course she feels alone and neglected, plus when she has been brought up very naive about politics, is it any surprise that the very manipulative Cersei is so able to take advantage of her? No. That said, Arya feels like Sansa is a clear favourite. It wasn't fair. Sansa had everything. She was two years older. Maybe by the time Arya had been born there had been nothing left. 
Often it felt that way. And you have to remember a lot of the times Arya is getting more attention is precisely because she's getting into more trouble. Ned has less of a concern and stress for Sansa because there's seemingly less to worry about. I don't think there is technically less to worry about. It's a recurring theme that Sansa is often overlooked and dismissed as a straightforward, dutiful girl in her storyline when there's certainly more to her than that. But they are two girls one who seeks attention or affection through trying to be perfect and the other through being wild. That's a massive generalization, but you get my point. Is there a reason for me saying this? <laughs> I think so. I think, I think I'm trying to get at that parenting is hard, sibling rivalry can be a massive struggle to try and deal with, but he does let Sansa down. Um, the other one to quickly mention is Fion. To stop Balon Greyjoy from uprising again, they take away Fion, his last male heir into captivity with the threats of executing him should Balon ever think to try anything. I find it entirely unsurprising that Ned Stark ended up being the one to take Fion on as his ward. Fion was always going to be treated horribly as a captive by anyone else. Else. Ned is all about protecting innocent children so he takes him in and tries to raise him much more fairly. Although is he good to Fionn? He's not cruel but certainly not caring. Fionn grows up feeling like an outsider. Small wonder Fionn becomes so arrogant and cocky in response to his insecurities there. My best guess is that Ned is troubled over what he would actually do if Balon did rise up and rebel again. When Cersei explains to Ned about how they pushed Bran out of the window because he saw them having sex and that would threaten the safety of their own children, Ned then thinks, if it came to that, the life of some child I did not know, against Rob and Sansa and Arya and Bran and Rickon, what would I do? Even more so, what would Catelyn do if it were Jon's life against the children of her body? He did not know. He prayed he never would. Which also actually reading that there now is a great hint early on that John isn't actually Ned's son. He doesn't list John in the children he's wagering against the life of some unknown child. He only mentions John when it's Catelyn wagering him against the other children. But yeah, he doesn't know. He doesn't want to think. So what if duty demanded he ever had to execute Theon, this innocent boy? I don't think he knows and I'm guessing he chooses not to think about it. Hopes such a day never comes and yet it is still in the back of his mind and so maybe you then end up with a child you want to raise well, you know you should care about, you try to do the practical things, only you can't quite dare to get attached. You come across very distant in case one day you're asked to kill him. And when for the later stages of Theon's childhood, that's your main paternal figure, someone who is incredibly emotionally distant to you, that's of course going to have a big effect. I kind of like that about Ned Stark, I think he's a great dad, but also certainly lets down his children in a lot of ways. He never tells John about his mother, he never quite prepares Sansa, he never in a way prepares Rob for everything, and he's far too distant to Theon. Just goes to show how well written he is, how someone can be a good dad and also a let down at the same time. I think most parents do let you down in a lot of ways. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad, although they can do depending on what, but sometimes it just means they're human. Let's wrap this up now though, shall we? So I hope this didn't lack some of the depth of my other videos, as I said it's just harder to clearly know as much about Ned. I hinted that I think one of his biggest mistakes was executing Sansa's direwolf lady, I feel he could have at least tried taking a later moment to argue with Robert again about it, or else just let Lady escape. I think his anger about Lady's death leaves him twice as righteous, twice as rivalrous and angry with Robert, too guilty to talk to Sansa properly, she's upset and angry with Ned, both daughters are angry with each other and lots of things <laughs> go wrong. There's the side of him there being dutiful, being the follower and accepting the king's command, even when he knows killing Lady is absolutely the morally wrong thing to do. Somehow rather than fighting the command, he gets wrapped up in feelings of his rivalry with Robert, and in accepting the command he is given more reason to feel anger at this man who has changed, more of an argument to press that point. See who you've become now, you're a man who would kill my daughter's direwolf kind of thing. He seems to think more of his frustration at who Robert has become there than he does about Sansa, but I think he regrets killing Lady. I think it's a good moment to emphasise the ongoing conflict in Ned between doing what feels right and doing what duty commands. 
The conflict also between putting duty first and putting family first. Because Ned is an honourable man, however, it's very difficult to make sense of what exactly honour means to him. I think that's a big part of why it feels hard to pick apart who Ned really is. Is honour as Jamie mostly sees it? Your reputation? How honourable others see you to be? No, because Ned sacrifices his honour to pretend Jon Snow is his bastard son. He sacrifices honour and truth confessing to the lie he sought to usurp the throne because he was told it would save Sansa's life. He broke his vows to King Aerys when joining the rebellion. Honour, I think, for him is this conflict between doing what is right and doing what duty would ordinarily dictate. He isn't so rigid about his bound code of honour as people tend to see him as being. It is an ongoing struggle. I think, yes, he is super rigorous and demanding of himself to be honourable and good, but he's not always so rigid on what exactly that means in different situations. He executes Lady Yes to do with rivalry, but also because duty demands he obeys the king, and he learns from that. Next time Robert demands something similar with Daenerys' death, Ned instead resigns. I said I don't like labelling people followers or leaders because it's kind of ridiculous, but also not entirely ridiculous, and I want to keep things brief anyway. Ned screw up a follower who was then forced to become a leader when he didn't want to. Being a leader means having to think and decide what is the right thing to do when it's not always clear. Following means dutifully sticking to what you're told is the right thing to do. That's the fundamental conflict there. You know, sometimes Sometimes people look at Ned Stark in the books as a kind of allegory for goodness and his death shows how being good or being honourable always gets defeated by the corruption of the world. To succeed you have to be ruthless and stuff, which I don't think adds up really. People forget George R. R. Martin is a staunch pacifist, I don't think he is making that message there. If I don't think he's making any message at all there really, I think he's exploring differences at a very mature level without necessarily providing a solution. Sometimes the people who dismiss Ned as losing because he's too honourable are also the people who fail to see that Tywin loses for the complete opposite reason. I think part of what makes Ned's tragedy so tragic is that there are so many different elements, a lot of them outside of his control, that can make you think Ah, uh, if only this had gone slightly different, if only this hadn't happened, he'd still be alive. Ned isn't some shining metaphor for honour because he is partly confused about what honour means to him. He places incredibly high pressures on himself without always knowing how to live up to them. He's a good man who, like all good men, are not flawless. And also like all good men, they try their best to make the world a slightly better place. Try to do a little good where they can. Ned dies, his family gets completely scattered, but still in some ways some of that goodness lives on through them. In many ways maybe that's the best he could hope for. That's not a happy ending, but it's <laughs> it's something. Um, yeah, I've tried to break down Ned's psychology, but I think this feels definitely like the least successful of my character analysis videos. I'm relying on you all to tell me what the hell I've missed or somehow managed to overlook, what I've gotten confused about, because that's the important bit for me with these videos. It's not about presenting a perfect, unquestionable argument, but it's about helping people to try and think more about a character or more about something. If it was about presenting the perfect argument, then this wouldn't be empathy, it would be knowledge. I think sometimes empathy doesn't mean understanding, it means trying to understand, even when you don't have a clue. This video was set up alongside me next analysing Catelyn, so that I can then talk deeply about Sansa, Arya, Jon, Theon, and maybe Robin Bran. It just made sense to touch on the parents a little before getting to the children. So yeah, leave your thoughts, like the video if you liked it, subscribe, support me on Patreon if you fancy doing that and seeing all the stuff there. A big thank you to World Anvil again, go and check the link, but um, otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Blue Core, Treat You Caber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Flying Spider, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Folliere and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.